It comes from Acts chapter 27, verses 1 through 3 and 13 through 20. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius, who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship from Admiridium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends, so they might provide for his needs. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Calda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure, so the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together, because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Syrtis. They lowered, sea, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battery from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. And when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We finally gave up all hope. We gave up all hope. Say those words. We yeah. gave up all hope. We gave up all hope. Pray with me, folks. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. You are our rock. You are our Redeemer. You're the wind beneath our wings. You're the ship that protects us from the elements. You're the well from which we drink. Amen. Amen. Any of you have a storyteller in your family? Somebody that tells a story, maybe the same story, over and over again? It usually starts out something like this. Did I ever tell you about the time when you go, yes? Or do you remember when, yes? Some of you are going, yes, I've got a preacher just like that right now. He's got his hand in the air. I've been here nine years with you folks. Everybody say, Lord have mercy. And I'm running out of stories, you know. Uh, John Wesley, uh, when he was appointing pastors back in the early days of the United Methodist Church, and People always gripe about why do they move Methodist pastors around so often. I really overstayed my due. That's not an announcement I'm about to move, by the way. But anyhow, <laughs> someone asked John Wesley, they said, why do you move them so often? He said, it's simple. I don't have a preacher out there that's got more than six months worth of good sermons. In <laughs> so, but uh, <clears throat> somebody in our family units loves to tell a story over and over and over. My kids tease me about, yeah, we know, Dad, that's the most dangerous intersection in South Texas. You've heard that. I wonder if Jesus ever told his stories over and over. If Jesus was sitting around the campfire one evening, hey, did I ever tell you guys about the time? Yes, Master, but would love to hear it one more time. We really would. What were some of the stories that Jesus told that linger with you? That's a real question. You know how I like interaction type sermons. When you think about the stories that Jesus told and the, and the parables that He preached and the conversations He had, what are some of the things that did you remember from your Sunday school, from other worship services? What are some things that you remember that you hold on to? What, what are some of your favorites? That He is. The story of Zacchaeus. That's awesome. I love that guy. I absolutely do. Thanks. Any others? The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Yeah. The Sermon on the Mount. Wow. Three chapters long. Two and a half hours long. Don't ever wrap up about one of my sermons getting too long. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. 
Yeah, that's the Beatitudes. Wow, what a powerful piece. Someone said something. The parable here. of the sower. The parable of the sower. That is awesome. Good ground, not so good ground. Birds, now they're rocking. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful. Any others? Yeah. When John baptized Jesus. Yeah. Powerful one. Powerful one. I like the story. It ends with that he who is without sin cast the first stone. Woman caught in sin. Yes. Everybody, get rock. Let's do it right now. You know? <laughs> and Jesus said, go ahead. I'll even hold the rock for you. Here's the deal. Whoever is without sin gets to throw the first stone. And they dropped him on the ground and they walked away. Wonderful story. I wonder how many times Jesus told that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Knowing Jesus, you probably won't have to say it just once. When he washed the feet. Say again. When he washed the feet. Oh. If you have, you know, you can have no part. Yeah. Wonderful. Jesus washing their feet there in the Gospel of John. If you stopped someone on the street, and ask them to name or describe or remember some of the, the stories that Jesus taught. One of the ones that would rise to the level is the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember that story? This guy's beat up. He's laying on the side of the road in a ditch, bleeding, robbed, left for dead. And a priest, a United Methodist pastor, walks by. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> First guy walks by and looks at him and does what? Nothing. Second one, a Levite, walks by and does what? Nothing. Nothing. And a third one comes by, a Samaritan. And y'all heard me preach that story before. And you know that the conflict there would have been horrendous. That the guy would have just said, you know, don't touch me, let me die. But the Samaritan did what? Took care of him. The Samaritan took care of him. Why did Jesus teach, tell that story? What was the whole purpose? Somebody had asked him what? A question. Who is my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? What's the greatest commandment, Jesus? Well, love God, love your neighbor. Okay, cool. Yeah, but who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells the story. And then he asks a question at the end of that story. He said, let me ask you this. Who was the neighbor to the man that was beat up and injured? And the one listening said, it was the one who showed mercy. The one who showed what? Mercy. And then what did Jesus say? Go and do likewise. Say that. Go, Go and, and do, do likewise. likewise. Years later, Jesus teaches that story. Jesus tells that story. And it lingers. And it stays with them. It was such an important story that it was written down. And over 2,000 years later, we still have it in our Bible. Several years later, after Jesus has been arrested, crucified, resurrected, and ascended, the church is beginning to grow. The church is beginning to build. And the book of Acts tells us a lot about what was going on. In fact, as we did a sermon series last year on Acts. Remember that? I remember because it was the best little video we put together. Charlie helped me get that together. But there's a story in the 27th chapter, and Amanda began to read part of it for us this morning. There's a story in the 27th chapter of the book of Acts about a shipwreck. People that study nautical history will tell you that this is one of the most detailed stories of a shipwreck in ancient literature from the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. It reads as though it's a, a, a captain's ship log today. I mean, it's just like a captain is sitting down, writing down, this, the wind is out of the northeast, the wind is this. You know, it talks about the islands are passing, it talks about the the wind and the waves. It talks about the depth at which all of these details that a captain of a ship would record. Aboard that ship, headed for Rome, are three groups of men. 
One group of men are the sailors, the crew, the ones that are taking care of the, the ship, running it, keeping the sails aloft, bailing out. The, they're the ones that are keeping that ship afloat, headed toward their destination. A second group of men aboard that ship were Roman soldiers. They were under the command of a man named Julius. And they had, I don't know how many of those men were guards and members of the centurion's uh, group, but there would have been a number of them. And they had a job. Their job was to guard and take care of the prisoners that was on that group, the ship. There's three groups of men. The crew, the Roman guards, and the prisoners. The Apostle Paul is one of those prisoners. He, along with a lot of other men, are chained. They're down there in the hull of that ship. And these storms are hitting them. They encounter what's almost probably hurricane-like force winds. And the crew begins to lose control of the ship. They do. It's a wonderful story. Go read it when you're, you know, <laughs> looking for a, a good novel. And eventually, this ship, it runs aground. They, they, they have land just in sight. They're trying to get that, that boat, that big ship, and it must have been big to carry a crew of 276 aboard. They see land, and it would have been the island of Malta in the Mediterranean. They see land, they're trying to get that ship there. But before they can get there, it literally runs aground on one of the reefs, a very reef protecting it. And it begins to break up. It begins to fall apart. <coughs> and The soldiers decided that they needed to kill all the prisoners. The reason was simple. When you're a Roman soldier and you have a prisoner that you're taking somewhere, it's not a good idea to lose your prisoner. The Roman authorities didn't look at that too kindly. He escaped. It could cost you your life. And it was not unusual for them, in case they could not get the prisoners delivered, to execute them. I don't know this from Scripture. But as I was researching some of this and, and, and reading some of the history of that time, what would have happened, it's more than a good chance that some of those prisoners were convicted Convicts, uh, convicted convicts. Well, there's a word. <laughs> Y'all are used to it. Uh, convicted cr criminals, convicted of capital punishment, of capital offenses. They called for the death penalty, and they were being taken, more than likely, being taken to Rome to be used in the gladiatorial games. Everybody go. Oh. There's more than a good chance that that's where they were headed, and they were going to be executed anyhow. And so you go, okay. But as the ship is breaking apart, and as the guards are making plans to do this, it wasn't part of the scripture that Amanda read for us. She took it right up to the part where we said, the captain's journal says, and we lost all hope. They were losing hope of any of them surviving. As they're about to get ready to execute those prisoners, this man named Julius steps forward and he says, Stop. Don't kill them. The author of the book of Acts is Luke. Acts has often been called volume two of the gospel. And as you step back into Luke's Gospel, there's a story of another Roman centurion who had a servant that was very ill. Who asked Jesus if he would go to his house and heal that man. And then that Roman centurion said, don't go to my house. 
I'm not worthy enough for you to enter my own place. He said, just say the word. Just give the word. And I know it will be done. I've often thought that that might be one of the most miraculous stories in the gospel. Because this Roman centurion was someone who expected his word to be carried out without fail. He knew that all he had to do was say the word and it would be so. And he knew that Jesus had the power to just simply say the word and it would be so. It would happen. That the forces of death would answer to his call. What was it in those two Roman centurions that caused them to show mercy. I probably read Acts 27 about 10 or 15 times. And my sermon title is Control. And I thought I was going to talk this week about self-control, losing control, being out of control, wanting control. And as I read this scripture over and over and over again, something began to really come out at me. And I really was stunned by that. The soldiers decided to kill the prisoners to keep them from swimming to shore and escaping. However, the centurion wanted to save Paul. And he wanted to save Paul. But he had something else in mind too. He stopped them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and head for land. He ordered, notice the words that are being used here. He didn't suggest. This centurion did what? He took control. He took control of the situation. He said, I don't know if you're the captain of the ship or not, but I'm in control right now. He looked at Paul and he said, you may be a man of God right now, but I'm in control. This Roman took control. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and head for land. He ordered the rest to grab hold of planks or debris from the ship. And in this way, everyone reached land safely. I think that speaks a word to us. It reminds us that God has a, a plan and God wants us all to reach land safely. Amanda stopped at that phrase. And we had no hope. We had come to the point we thought there is no hope. Let me ask this question. Is no hope the Christian message? Is that the message that the Christian faith teaches? There's no hope. There are some that seem to teach that. There are some that says there's hope for me, but not so much for you. And why not? Why is there no hope for me? Well, you don't think right. You don't believe right. You don't pray or worship in just the right way. And your personal meeting with Jesus sounds a little fishy to me. So I'm sorry, but you have no hope of being rescued. So I ask my question again. Is no hope the Christian message? Is that what the well offers the world? Our calling as Christians, our caring, our calling as Christians, as followers of Christ, is to announce that there is hope and then put our lives into gear to do whatever we can within our own spheres of areas, those areas that we can control to give people a little hope. And while we're at it, maybe grab hold of a plank ourselves, a little hope for our own hope. The Roman centurion, for whatever reason, grabbed hold of the situation and made sure that all made it safely ashore. We hear a lot of angry language around us sometimes. We hear a lot of condemning 
around us sometimes. We hear a lot of, you're not worthy. You don't belong here. You're not one of us. You're one of them. We hear a lot of hateful language that seems to take hope away from some people. That seems to take control away from some people. The crew did the best they could. But their situation became hopeless in saving the ship. And the best they could do was try to beach that ship on an island. One day Jesus told a story to a man who was trying to figure out who his neighbor was. And at the end of the story, he asked him a simple question. Who is the one that is your neighbor? Who was neighbor to the man that was injured? And the guy quickly got it. He said, it was the one who showed mercy. And then Jesus gave him a simple commandment. Go and do likewise. The centurion, Julius, aboard that ship, however he heard the message, however it came to him through the wind, however it came to him through Paul, however it came to him, he heard that message and he responded and he showed all of those 276 aboard, other 275 aboard there, what mercy looked like. I am reminded that all of us are in a ship together. As my dad often reminded me, Ronnie, there's no such thing as a hole in your end of the boat. If the boat is taking on water, we're all in danger. And it's incumbent upon us to make sure that not just all the ones that are here this morning, but all of those out there find safe shelter as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, our calling is to let others know there is hope. Our calling is to help others find hope. Our calling is to provide hope in all the acts of social justice and human kindness we can so that all can make it to shore safely. God help us remember and respond to our calling. In Jesus' name, amen.